All right, everyone. Welcome back. I hope you've had a good weekend. I hope you've been reading your Connected, <clears throat> which I'll be talking about a little bit. So we are getting into chapter three, talking about culture. Culture is a big, big part of uh, sociology. However, we think of culture as being different than society. Society we generally think of as <clears throat> a group of people living in some given territory, governed by some you know, common government, usually having some basic common culture. Now, there's debate about, you know, where does one society end and one begin, especially when you have uh, global trends and say pop culture or religion or uh, types of government and so on and so forth. So we trend generally think of culture as kind of uh, folkways, different, <coughs> excuse me, different ways in which our humanity is expressed. Now you, well, we'll get there. Hold on. Okay. So, um, recently, well, fairly recently in the 1970s, <laughs> um, fairly recently in terms of the history of sociology, uh, there was what's called the cultural turn. And it was not just in sociology, but in social sciences more broadly, because before then there had been kind of a crude uh, sort of evolutionary approach, and I say crude because it was, uh, you know, today won't really hold up, and because culture wasn't taken very seriously, like you wouldn't have um, a primatologist who study primates, you know, monkeys and gorillas and humans and so on, um, you know, you would never hear them talk about culture. Um, whereas today you certainly do hear primatologists talk about culture. So anyway, there are some things that we call cultural universals because we find them in pretty much every culture. <clears throat> um, one being a complex language, which I'll talk about in a moment, family systems, marriage, throughout human his most of human history, marriage was not so much, you know, trying to find your soulmate, trying to find, you know, the, your one true love, but was actually uh, really focused more on um, family alliances and, you know, creating clan alliances and political uh, systems and so on. Uh, an important one is incest prohibition. Now, if you're in my social psychology class, I'm sorry you have to hear this story again. Um, the, so <clears throat> the social psychologist Jonathan Haidt has, a, has this story, this kind of thought experiment, where he asks you to imagine this scenario and try to figure out what, if something's wrong with it and why. So a biological brother and sister, they're on some deserted island forever, or not forever, for some reason. Um, they're in their, say, mid to late 20s. Um, you know, they're adults, and they decide they're going to have sexual intercourse. And um, so they they do this, and they decide to use every form of protection. And he's, uh, you know, had had a, a vasectomy and so on. So there's no way that they can have any children. There's no offspring going to come of this. Um, and so they also decide that they're never going to tell anyone. So it's not going to lead to any, uh, you know problems and you know people aren't going to look at them differently or something and it ends up making them closer in terms of you know better family members and so on so and then whoops jonathan hate he lays out this story and he says okay so what's wrong with how many of you think that that's still wrong that they do this and i ask this question and usually about 90 95 percent of the class raises their hand um or you know dials in on the the clicker bar graph so vast vast majority you know still say it's wrong and then i'll ask why and they say well you know if they were to have children and i say but that's already be contro been controlled for. They're not going to have children. And say so people will say, well, maybe it will cause, you know, problems. And I say, no, remember, it strengthened their relationship. 
and uh, we go through it and then i say how many of you even after hearing those still think that it's wrong it's still you know 90 95 percent whatever it's almost no change basically and the point being <laughs> the point isn't the point being that even though you can't by our sort of standards of, of logic and debate that we've developed where you lay out the evidence and you know choose the rational answer even though you can't identify what's wrong with it using in standard systems of logic and debate you still know that it's wrong and why is that what is it that's wrong what that is is biology it's biology speaking and saying no <laughs> don't do that that's not going to be good for you know that's not going to be good for the species you know we just can't always articulate um by our, our our biology and this is going to be 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 very important as we uh move on so anyway second time i've had to tell that story this week or last week anyway whatever okay i think i'm done now um <clears throat> other things that we see art dancing tattoos body adornment um i have a tattoo that you know maybe next time i'll i'll show it's actually Right now, I still believe that it's the oldest tattoo they found, like from 2,000 years ago, from a Siberian uh, warrior priest, and it's a stag, uh, you know, kind of, kind of like an elk or a, a deer, you know, with uh, antlers and so on. <clears throat> anyway, so they've been doing it for thousands of years. Right now, you know, it sounds cool, like, oh, it's... I've got the oldest tattoo that they've ever found. Inevitably, archaeologists are going to find others and it's going to become less cool over time. You know, it's just not going to be the same when, you know, I say, oh, I've got the, you know, 12th oldest tattoo. It just doesn't quite have the same, same ring. Uh, rules of hygiene, though they may differ, every society and every culture has had various different rules of hygiene. <clears throat> One of the things I often think about as kind of an environmental sociologist and is thinking of um, the different perfumes and colognes, especially ones that are made from, you know, really, really bad toxic chemicals that we, you know, and, and uh, deodorants and antiperspirants that we just douse ourselves in um, and have been for a few decades now in the industrialized world. And I have a feeling that, you know, in a few generations, if you, you know, a few decades from now, you know, people look back at us at this time and think how weird it was that we covered ourselves and poison because we didn't like our own smell or you know something like that um <clears throat> so if there's one thing you get out of today's course i hope i mean today's class um i hope it's that you realize that rational choice theory is a bunch of bullshit okay well <laughs> that's quite a statement what am i talking about what is rational choice theory rational choice theory was the dominant way in which basically social scientists and really all scientists thought about human behavior throughout much of the 20th century and it still is kind of the dominant way in which most societies especially western societies and increasingly i mean it really in any modern industrial society is based on these ideas of rational choice so rational choice theory in a nutshell, this idea that human beings base their behavior on rational calculations, they act with rationality when making choices, their choices are aimed at, you know, giving themselves more pleasure or more profit and so on and so forth. Um, it takes the individual decision making unit as sort of the typical, the, uh, the archetype uh, of so on and so forth. Okay, so as I said, rational choice theory, the dominant theory, especially in um, the social sciences, in sociology, in political science, and especially economics, and it, you know, it was more or less dropped by sociology fairly early on, uh, followed by psychology, political science, uh, economics, tried to hold on to it and they you know still to this day i think there are still uh people 
operating under the delusion that we <laughs> operate by rational by making rational choices so you know here's kind of a cartoon you've got a couple here they've obviously had a few bottles of wine um, and he's saying if I were to kiss you then there's a 17% probability that we might get married and that has a 24% likelihood uh, that we'd have children etc etc I'm not sure if I can risk it you know in the real world we don't actually calculate our you know uh, what's going to give us the most pleasure or the most profit um, oftentimes we'll make terrible decisions for ourselves um, for a whole range of reasons uh, but it's important to understand that our societies especially during the, the 20th century were really designed based on the idea that that we are rational choice actors and not only that but that we can become that way and you know that's that's debatable and we'll sort of be returning to that okay so i talked so mentioned language um a couple of things about language language again one of these universals uh, for a long time in psychology the behavioral psychology view <coughs> excuse me behavioral psychology basically sees everything as a result of stimulus and response of uh, reward and punishment and so you're constantly learning through you know through being rewarded or punishment punished in one way or another and so the behaviorists view on language was that children learned language by hearing their parents and that's how they learned how grammar worked uh, essentially in the, and that was the dominant view in linguistics for a while in the late 1950s the young then young uh, Noam Chomsky a famous linguist and political activist uh, argued against this and he said that you know if you actually look at and listen to kids talk um, they come up they're able to come up with grammatically complex sentences without really even being exposed to them and uh, so he argued that there's this universal grammar that there's this you know kind of deep structure of grammar rules that's why you know kids everywhere learn languages um even if they're very different uh there's all there's always some you know some root structure there so anyway this was a huge attack on uh behaviorism on behaviorism in linguistics in particular but then it sort of opened the door to an attack on all sorts of uh, behavioral schools of thought and it really gave birth to cognitive psychology and this idea that you know there are certain things that are really innate uh, that make us who we are related to linguistics is semiotics the study in way which in which linguistic and non-linguistic uh, meaning is generated how we how we um, express different emotions and things like this you know semiotics was used for a long time studying like uh, graphic design advertisements things like that um, you know illustrations and so on you know it's kind of been given a new life uh, by this increasing world of emojis and emoticons and so on and so forth. Um, in fact, a lot of psychologists have, have, have been involved with various social media and other companies to develop uh, a lot of these emojis. A famous theory in linguistics that's sort of relevant to sociology is the linguistic relativity hypothesis, also known as the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis. I would know both of those names. This is this idea that since people learn and know different languages, we're sort of limited our perceptions are limited by our language uh, and the conclusion there that being then that different languages lead to different thought patterns and there's some truth to that and there's I, I believe most linguists would argue against that uh, today while yes there are um, different 
different uh, words that we use and, you know, people born in, uh, you know, different societies will use different words like i forget there's i forget how many uh different words there are synonyms there are for the word shame in china but it's you know way way more than you would find in the english language so there are these different different forms of thought different forms of of, of language and thought that do lead us to you know think differently and so on less radically than than was once presumed though um anyway so other <clears throat> kind of giving us just kind of a background of the sort of evolution of social types the oldest type of societies are hunting gathering societies <coughs> excuse me there are roughly 250,000 or so in the world. They're rapidly disappearing. Most of them are in the Amazon basin. Um, I was just reading about coronavirus is actually leading them to uh, come into civilization because they're, you know, because they're already been having some interactions with um, with other tribes and so they're they're contracting these illnesses so it is quite likely that within our lifetime um, hunting gathering societies could disappear and that would be a huge huge shift in in human social organization um, because these have been around for a long long time um, we still see them in uh, places like Papua New Guinea, for example. I have a cousin who married into a, a tribe in Papua New Guinea, and her husband was on the national rugby team, and uh, was a famous rugby player. And I think there's some a story of him, of of um these villages his village was playing a, a neighboring village and i don't think he was allowed to play because of you know because he was so good because he's a national star um and and i should say these tribes you know they'll live in these valleys and oftentimes will be fairly remote from each other even and so anyway these tribes are playing and i guess he was allowed to play and you know he's doing a good job and um, my wife i don't think had been introduced to this new tribe and you know like i said they're not even they don't even really like outsiders from just over a few uh ridges so this woman coming from <coughs> excuse me <coughs> from california and you know very much looking californian um you know it was quite a shock to this tribe and you know i think the game was starting to go badly and uh some fights break out and stuff and uh, some concussions are made and some bones are broken and whatnot. Interestingly, um, then the tribes, they sort of patch things up through what's called blood wealth. And you see this um, in a lot of tribal cultures where there will be a conflict and then they'll sort of tally up the damage um, and give each other that much crops or that much meat or whatever it might be. Now, this is true not just in Papua New Guinea, but in societies around the world, um, in pastoral and agrarian society as well. Pastoral is tending domesticated animals like sheep and goats and uh, horses and cattle and so on. Uh, agrarian being, you know, cultivating crops, growing of, of, of farm crops and so on. Um, and oftentimes these groups will be somewhat symbiotic, they'll trade together and so on. One of the things that I found kind of interesting, and I did research on warfare in in Eastern Africa between a lot of pastoral and agrarian groups, and one of the things that you find in when you look at conflict in Africa, going back to the 1960s and 1970s, really beginning then, is that you had these systems of blood wealth where, like I said, you'd have these conflicts, but people would be fighting each other primarily with uh, spears or machetes, things like that. So you wouldn't have huge, you know, huge death tolls, especially if these were, you know, fairly small groups that were fighting. Um, once people get machine guns, that changes because all of a sudden you can shoot a whole bunch of people and all of a sudden the whole blood wealth system kind of breaks down because, you know, you just, the system wasn't made to account for that many uh, people and that many crops being, being paid in, in compensation.
So anyway, there's, it's kind of an, it's not spoken, it's kind of an unspoken history of Africa, the sort of destruction of the legal system uh, because of machine guns. Um, anyway, kind of, kind of fascinating and, and very tragic in, in many ways. Um, traditional societies, this is, you know, feudal societies, uh, aristocracies, they sort of disappear in the 1800s, you could argue coming back, although at this time they were, you know, held together by hereditary empires and, and, and things like that. <clears throat> um, you also have colonialism and, and you know, throughout history groups have been uh spreading and conquering and so on and so forth in <clears throat> in the 1500s you start to get europe uh european conquest and we have to be very like precise about what we're talking about when we say europeans we're not talking about you know people in uh say germany or uh the plains of the danube river you know eastern europe uh slavic peoples going out and conquering the americas it was uh for some reason people in like england and spain and italy and france and uh you know holland and so on people in western europe that happen to be uh, by oceans uh, so that's a that's a big part when we talk about european you know europe conquering the world well we're talking about you know the very western edges uh, of europe uh we talk about industrialized societies so i'll kind of like move past them fairly quickly i do want to talk about <clears throat> you know when we talk about colonialism one of the reasons that europeans were were allowed to were able to conquer the world has a lot to do with some of the stuff that's going on in the world today. So, <clears throat> like disease, the spread of infectious disease. So, you know, it's I've, I've watched over the last several months as people, you know, have been, uh, first of all, skeptical that this disease was that big of a deal, and then going to, you know, just outlandish conspiracy theories and, uh, you know, thinking that this is, you know, the end times or whatever it might be. You know, if you look at human history, uh, the human history has been plagued by pandemics. And I mean that, you know, uh, very literally. So, um, <clears throat> before jumping in there, I do want to talk about connected a bit. And like I said, either of these versions work. They both, uh, they both talk about uh, social connections. So again, just kind of a reminder of what we're talking about here. <clears throat> we've got these nodes and these nodes for our purposes can be a person the lines are relationships sometimes they're called ties between two people um embedded is the degree to which a person is connected within the network so you have you know less embedded people down here in the uh, periphery um more embedded people here would be more uh central to the network so say this was, um, you know, a, a coronavirus spread and yellow was people um, with coronavirus and you know, bigger yellow was would be, say, uh, people who are, who are um, more sick or something like that. So you, what, you, what you see with then is, say, it's, you know, it's kind of spreading through the networks kind of in these central areas, but it's making its way to uh, the other parts of the social network. So the social network then is all these connections and ties within a group or a collection of uh, groups. So <clears throat> just kind of a review of that kind of first chapter or two of um, the book Connected. Contagion, <clears throat> you know, what flows across ties. These can be coronavirus germs, uh, money, violence, fashion, organs, happiness, obesity, and some of the social stuff that uh, that connect the book Connected talks about. Uh, connection, we use this term to refer to who is connected to whom. Homophily is important. It's this tendency to associate with people who resemble ourselves. Um, this doesn't mean just, you know, that we're destined to, you know, be in the, you know, <laughs> just to, you know, want to be around people who are of the same racial group or of the same uh, religion or whatever it might be but it tends it does mean we tend to be around 
from people who share our interests and uh, and, and things like that. So there is some of that that is definitely uh, going on. Uh, transitivity, this is a concept we use to say that basically everybody in a relationship, everyone knows each other, it kind of forms a, a triangle. So uh, person A here um, has high transitivity, like, you know, they're in these triangles, everyone knows each other, basically. Um, uh, person B uh, here, we say they have low transitivity because um, they don't know everybody, but they're sort of a bridge to people, uh, different groups. Um, in the sort of negative case of, say, coronavirus, they would, you know, bring one cluster of friends in contact with another because they would be that sort of um, sort of bridge there. So we know things like happiness, for example, are partly genetic and partly social. Um, <clears throat> so we believe that, you know, long term happiness, you know, your sort of general um, trait that you that you're in 50 percent basically um, is, is the result of genes and about 10 percent the result of circumstance, you know, what you think of your quality of life. You know, about 40% attitude and so on. So that's kind of fascinating. <clears throat> a lot of it, you know, is stuff you can't do much about your genes. Um, some of it, you know, circumstance, some you can and can't do about that. Um, then attitude, you know, how you think about it, which can be very much influenced by genes and circumstance. So it's all very uh, confusing sometimes. Loneliness. Now, this is something that's probably, you know, that's hugely important right now, um, especially as we're going through uh, this this pandemic and this uh, crisis that is, ha has has brought about more loneliness. Um, I read that, you know, at some point back in June, 25% of people 18 to 25 years old uh, felt suicidal at some point. A lot of this has to do with depression coming from loneliness. <clears throat> You know, people your age, when I say your age, traditional sort of college age, um, this is the time when people are usually, there's sort of a biological urge to connect with other people and so on. Um, so we know loneliness, you know, brings about, you know, a lot of, a lot of um, depression. Um, each extra friend that you have actually reduces the frequency of loneliness by two days per year, which is really kind of a fascinating, fascinating thing to think about. Now, when we think about friendship, how do we measure friendship? We use it, by, we measure by something called the association index. So the association index um, of two animals is measured by the amount of time that they spend together. And we can quantify the extent of social interaction through grooming or play. Um, <clears throat> In a group of four individuals, for example, there are six possible ties connecting pairs of individuals. So four times three divided by two equals six, basically. So anyway, um, this has been, you know, observed in the wild and Jane Goodall famously has uh, documented this. Uh, if you have a chance to watch the fairly recent, I think it's actually made last year or two, um, the documentary called Jane, uh, highly, highly recommended on National Geographic. Uh, really, really fascinating woman, Jane, Jane Goodall, who went with really no training in primatology and, you know, <laughs> taught us more primatology than probably any other, uh, any other primate has <clears throat> uh, before or since then. Okay, so um, going back here, looking at the, the, the different ties, if all ties are, are observed, the group has 100% density of ties, the network is fully saturated. Um, in a study of 30 primate species, density averaged about 75%. Uh, Social mammals are status-seeking, that means that oftentimes we are trying to become friends with people who are more popular or, uh, you know, higher status in the group, that sort of thing. Um, this leads to something that in social 
network analysis is called degree assortativity. Degree meaning <clears throat> the number of social connections, assortativity meaning the preferential sort sorting that connects individuals who uh, resemble one another, that sort of homophily that uh, I mentioned earlier. Now, there's a tendency of individuals with similar number of ties to be connected uh, to each other. We find this interestingly in um, in a in a in a whole range of different <laughs> different animals. We find the same base basic sort of mathematical math, bleh, mathematical structure in uh, elephants, dolphins, orcas, uh, humans, other primates. Really kind of fascinating and you kind of wonder, okay, what's going on here? Why is that? Um, I'll explain in a moment. So de degree assortativity, maybe it would help by explaining explaining degree dissortativity, um, which is airport hubs like Denver and Chicago. You know, these are major hubs um, that are connected to a lot of smaller ones like Omaha, Epley Airfield in Omaha, small one in, say, uh, Topeka, Kansas, or something like this. So a lot of these smaller ones aren't connected to each other, but they are connected to, you know, say these small ones aren't connected to each other, but maybe they're all uh, connected to Chicago or uh, Denver, these, you know, major, major hubs. So as Christakis explains it in, in his, in his uh, book Blueprint, and just read it here, the best way to grasp this is to imagine the network that is dissortative, so like this, the airport network one. You've got a hub and spoke system with one or two very popular individuals connected to all others in the group. If any individual in the network becomes infected, the disease could reach all the groups in just two hops, from the initial individual directly to the hub, and then from the hub to the entire group. So this applies in the converse too. Organizing the same set of individuals with degree assortativity generally helps to keep outbreaks more confined, for instance on the periphery of the social network. This collective immunity is wholly distinct from individual level immunity, meaning the strength of each person's immune system. So this is really kind of fascinating then. Okay, so what then is the benefit of this degree assortativity? Um, where, you know, it's not like this hub and spoke system. You've just got, uh, you've got clusters that are sort of, you know, clustered together and then they're sort of, you know, linked to things that are, go through various other connections. What's the benefit of this degree assortativity? Basically, it slows the spread of infectious disease. Mathematically, having people connect to one another according to popularity uh, reduces the risk of epidemics. Because popular people, high status species members, are not going to equally apportion their time and energy and their, you know, connection or whatever to everyone in the group. Um, so don't think of this necessarily in terms of like, you know, who's popular in your you know, sorority or your fraternity or high school or <laughs> whatever uh, that it's, it's on sort of a deeper level, but, um, but it's really kind of fascinating uh, that our friendship networks and, you know, you can even get into like introversion, extroversion, uh, social networks and things like that. <clears throat> <coughs> We've uh, we've used these epidemiological models to understand our social networks, and our social networks have developed in the way that they have to slow the spread of of uh, epidemics, essentially. Um, so really fascinating, and I think you know very relevant to today, because as we know, we are living in pandemic times. As I said earlier, there's nothing, uh, you know, necessarily new or uh, revolutionary about this. There have long been, well, as I said, pandemics have long plagued uh, human history. So
so I will talk about a few of them and then I'll sort of uh, resume on Thursday. Uh, so <clears throat> a few plagues. One the just first of all, this book is a classic book and it's pretty short, but it's kind of one of the first books that really gave uh, a, a good history of disease and the impact that it had on societies around the world. And it really focused on three of them, uh, the Justinian plague, which in the mid 500s killed about 30 million people, uh, the Black Death, which killed about a third of people in um, in Europe, uh, 75 to 200 million people in Eurasia and North America uh, in the 1300s, and then what's sometimes called the Third Plaid Plague Pandemic, um, this, this really bad pandemic that hit um, China and India in the 1800s and killed about uh, 12 million people. <clears throat> a fascinating book came out just a few years ago and, and I'm going to talk about this because it kind of leads into <clears throat> obviously our discussions of, of culture but then next week when we talk about the environment and population and stuff like that so you know for hundreds of years um, um, 1500 years, European scholars have been talking about the fall of the Roman Empire, and it's usually a political story, you know, the barbarians invading and so on and so forth. But now we're starting to have a better understanding of the natural science uh, behind it. We're having a better understanding of climate, and we're also understanding disease and some of these things better. So one of the things we're starting to understand now is the, is climate and, and the role that, you know, climate change has played. Not, and I'm not talking about just the recent climate change. I mean, you know, like ice age and sting, things like this. So we have ice cores and, from, and we have cave stones and, and, and sediments from wherever. And we can look then at the chemistry and the isotopes and the various different properties of these, um, of these ice cores to get a better idea of what's of what the climate was like uh, in the past. And then we can compare this with, uh, with uh, the modern record. What's kind of fascinating is back in the in Roman times the writers was always talking about how rainy it was and then later on in the you know more recent times people have thought oh they were you know kind of silly talking about how rainy it was because it's clearly the Mediterranean is not a, you know that rainy of a place but now we know of having you know better science that it actually was much more rainy back then and that the Roman Empire uh, was allowed to build and grow partly because the climatic conditions worked out in its favor. Now we can also look at human bones and archaeology and have a better idea of what disease and illnesses uh, people are suffering from. So you have human bones and we can look at their shape and the scarring that has happened. Um, you have chemical signatures, stable isotopes of carbon and nitrogen that occur naturally in the environment um, due to their extra neurons, heavy isotopes are cycled through nature down slightly different tracks. Uh, nitrogen isotopes are a sign of, uh, you know, basically uh, creatures, you know, place in the food chain. The bone tissue of creatures toward the top of the pyramid is relatively enriched with heavy isotopes, uh, so it's stable isotopes tend to reflect the origin of nutrients uh, to make human bones, so they were, you know, higher on the, the food chain. So we can also have a better understanding of disease, too. We can, you know, the effect that disease has on, on bones and stuff. So really, you know, if you're interested in sort of, you know, kind of cutting-edge history, I highly, highly recommend uh, the book The Fate of Rome uh, by Kyle Harper. It's also superbly written, kind of reads like a, I think the review is, reads like a dystopian science fiction or something. <laughs> um, <clears throat> if you want more of that. Okay, so the other things that we see that happen as a result of <clears throat> these pandemics. So Rome gets hit by uh, the what's called the Antonine Plague. It was named after the um, the Antonine family, which have just happened to be the rulers at the time. You know, the, the 
Donald Trump has has called the um, the coronavirus various <laughs> names out of China, um, but ironically, you know, you know, in like a hundred or a couple hundred years, it might be called the Trump plague, not because it originated in the United States or was caused by the Trumps or anything, but you know, he just happened to be the president at the time or something. Um, kind of like the Antonin plague, you might see that happen. So the Antonine Plague begins somewhere in Eurasia in 165, and by 172, it's sort of wrecked the Roman army. Um, it's really the first event to be called a, um, a, a pandemic, and it's an ex eschatological event. Uh, eschatological meaning sort of an end times. Eschatology means end times, end of the world sort of belief. Um, you, you see this this outbreak of Apolline religion. This uh, Apollo was supposed to be the, I guess, the, 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 the eschatological deity at that at that moment so what was it what was this pandemic uh it was it was smallpox uh, smallpox is airborne it's directly transmissible uh it's got kind of like coronavirus you know it's got a long incubation phase um unlike coronavirus it's you know characterized by these painful lesions and pustules Chicken pox and measles are similar in the early early stages, but uh, smallpox gets deeper lesions and just kind of nastier protrusions. Small top, blah, blah, blah. Smallpox is not that old. Um, one analysis finds that it's diverged from its most common ancestor in Africa only a couple thousand years ago, which is, as a, again, not that long in terms of uh, biological or human history. And a new genomic study finds that it underwent a major evolution uh, in the 1500s as a result of the age of exploration. So, and I'll return to that in a moment. Well, looking at <clears throat> kind of Italian towns and, you know, kind of what you saw, what would see in uh, Roman times, <clears throat> you also have the time, yeah, the, the role that time plays. So, you know, throughout the month of the year, you have, you know, different diseases at different times. So in Italy at the time, you know, the summer months, a lot of gastroenteric disease. So <clears throat> throughout most of human history, uh, you know, diarrhea has been a major, major killer. And that's, you know, just been just been the way it's been. <laughs> uh, respiratory disease too. So you would tend to tended to see respiratory disease more often um, in in the in the winter months when it was cooler um, you know and go down during the summer and go back up again in the fall generally like what we see here and sadly what we're probably going to see with uh, coronavirus malaria um, so malaria was big in Rome you know I had a lot of standing water in these urban places uh, it tended to take off in in the summer months mosquitoes did well during those times. So the Roman Empire really really fell apart as a result of climate changes, pandemics, um, there was a drought, you saw the first fall of Rome, but then it sort of came back better than ever, or it came back strong at least. <laughs> um, it, it expands more, but then in the 1400s it starts to fall apart. Um, it gets hit by a number of pandemics, you get the bubonic plague, you get this little ice age happen, and <clears throat> you get the Justinian age and this this flea uh, that really starts to hit. So two thirds out of the great pandemics to hit Rome came from south, from probably Africa, um, northern Africa at this time. Remember, it's much wetter, much wetter uh, than it is now or coming from what would be the Middle East today. And this isn't coming necessarily from barnyard animals. This is coming from all of these different animals that humans are coming into contact with. As humans encroach upon, you know, rainforests and things like these, we start to, uh, well, we start to 
encroach upon other habitats, come into contact with other animals, um, and you see we get new pathogens, new illnesses being brought by new, new diseases. So measles comes from cattle, tuberculosis, cattle, smallpox, uh, probably cattle, the flu, pigs and ducks, pertussis, you know, um, pneumonia and stuff like that, pigs, dogs, uh, malaria, um, and stuff comes from, from uh, mosquitoes, although this comes from birds, chickens, ducks, maybe, question mark. So, you know, in the, the classic plague model, this is one that hit Rome, uh, you had this flea that, you know, was living on this marmot, and the marmot had become immune to it, basically, but, you know, it hopped over to this rat, and rats love to travel around with humans, and they uh, then, you know, followed humans around for, for a long time, and then the flea jumps to uh, humans, and then you get the pandemic phase when it's able to directly transmit to, to another uh, person. So in Rome, you get, you know, you get this uh, invasion. I love this map, uh, this, this rat map. I used to have a lot of pet rats <clears throat> when I was in college. They never gave me any diseases, though I was allergic to them, I found out. So this led to just collapse, just huge collapses of Roman society, and you already had, you know, the empire was stretched pretty thin, it was split in two, you had the Eastern Empire over here, uh, the Western Empire in Rome, and this really, you know, begins to collapse, and, you know, they kind of go their own way. Um, <clears throat> You get the Dark Ages here, the biggest regression in human history. Um, you have the Romans make cement, and then, you know, for a few centuries, there's cement buildings that people are living in, but they don't know how they were made. You know, I learned in England that last year that um, <clears throat> the Romans would put wool from uh, from the sheep in their pillows, you know, because they were much more comfortable. And when the Roman Empire fell, that knowledge went away for a few centuries. And so the the, the Britons were putting a straw <laughs> in their in their pillow mattresses um, for a few centuries before, you know, going back to the old Roman way of uh, of putting uh, of putting wool in there. So the story there, there being that, you know, a pandemic can really destroy a civilization and take knowledge back, or, you know, regress knowledge back uh, for quite some time. Other things that happened, like I said, huge changes. One big change was the emergence of uh, the Christian religion. You know, Christianity had already been adopted by the Roman Empire, but it just becomes more sort of embedded and ingrained in sort of European culture at this time. One of the major reasons being that, you know, a lot of churches were trying to help people that were that were sick and dying. And the, the Christian faith really spoke to people, the, the meek and the poor and the downtrodden and so on. Um, and it was just a very powerful, powerful message, and so it kind of it kind of went along with this uh, this stage of pandemics. Okay, so that's all I'm going to do today. I'm believe it or not, not done talking about pandemics quite yet. Um, and then next time we will talk about uh, some kind of fascinating social and political psychology stuff. Um, but this should give you enough to talk about in uh, pack back during class today. All right, have a good afternoon, everyone.